Huh. Hmm. Uh, oh, boy. <sighs> I'm worn out now. The advice provided on this podcast is general advice only. All statements made are considered by the participants to be accurate, but accuracy cannot be guaranteed. It has been prepared without taking into account your objectives, financial situations, or needs. All participants in this podcast, including guests, may have a financial interest in any or all of the products or services mentioned. Before acting on this advice, you should consider the appropriateness of the advice, having regard to your own objectives, financial situations, and needs. If any private products are detailed on this podcast, you should obtain a product disclosure statement relating to the products and consider its contents before making any decisions. Where quoted, past performance is not indicative of future results. Recorded May 12th, 2017. It's the Money Path Podcast. Episode 71 with Bob Iacchino and Mike Arnold, founders of Path Trading Partners. Today's What and Why segment is sponsored by Motive Wave. Go to pathtradingpartners.com and download your 14 day free trial. So let's join Bob and Mike with the casual conversations of news in the markets. I played bass in a talent show in college. I never knew this. Yeah, my friend of mine who had done a basketball scholarship and he quit, ended up quitting the team before his junior year. So he had very few classes during the season and a lot of time. So he went and got himself a guitar and decided to teach himself how to play. And by nearing the end of senior year, he had, uh, you know, taught himself to strum quite a few songs and even had a couple of really, really bad guitar solos worked out. And so he goes, why don't we do the talent show? What am I going to do? I can't sing. I can't play. He goes, so you'll play bass. I'm like, I don't play bass. He goes, go get a bass and I'll show you some stuff. So it was like one note for eight bars and then another note for eight bars. And it was fun. We won the talent show. So there you, Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we won the talent show. I also won the pizza eating contest that year. Did I ever tell you that? You know. Yeah. I was against two really big guys. Uh, three, actually. Two really big guys and one really short big guy and me. I think I weighed maybe 160 pounds at the time. But the competition was how much pizza you could eat in an amount of time. So while they were trying to jam, you know, individual slices in their mouth, I made like four Decker pizza sandwiches, <laughs> you know, facing each other. And then I did what in high school we used to call power eating, which is you just wedge it into your mouth and then push with the palm of your hand and while you're creating another slice. So you're pushing, chewing, swallowing all at the same time. And before that other one is completely in your mouth, you have lined up your second pizza sandwich behind it and you're pushing that. So when it got done, when it got time to swallow, I would be swallowing four pieces at a time while they'd be swallowing one. So when the time was up, I had finished like a pizza and a half and they had finished like one. Genius. Yeah, right, you've now accomplished something that you've never accomplished before. You What's that? Physically ill in the first five minutes of our talking. It's funny because that actually makes me want pizza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. Oh, jeez. And I was thinking of having pizza for dinner tonight. Now you've broken that. I do not should, want pizza. You should try power eating your pizza tonight. <laughs> oh. It's so good that way. I don't want to power eat anything now. <laughs> you know, I have a, I'm wondering. I was wondering about this as I was walking to my Bloomberg TV spot yesterday. I was walking from an area of the West Loop in Chicago over to the CBOT, or rather the CME group, the CBOT building. And um, thinking about this whole thing, because I was listening to Bloomberg Radio on my iPhone. There were a lot of plugs in there. Anyway, listening to, my, to Bloomberg Radio on my iPhone, and I was hearing this guy talk about, uh, is it Google Home? Is that what it's called? There's Alexa, and then there's... Yeah, the Google Home. Yes. Is it Echo? Who has Echo? That's Amazon. Again, that's... that's Amazon, that's, so Amazon yes, Alexa Echo. is on Echo and the Dot and everything else, and uh, Google has the Google Home thing. Okay, so we're talking about... This guy was... He was really smart, a really smart guy, and he says he has both of them, and he kind of plays them off of each other. He'll s turn both of them on and ask the question and see which one answers first. 
And he goes, depending on the subject, they're both really good. One will answer, one will beat one one time and the other will beat the other another time. And he was talking about how Siri is not as good. He said, but he's sure that Apple will catch up. And when they do, how different would it be for him to just pull his iPhone out and say it to his iPhone as opposed to saying it to one of the home devices? He said, you know, everyone's always got their phone with them anyway. And he was talking about how he, but he does use them. He walks in and he says, uh, you know, Google, turn on, hey, Google, turn on the lights or whatever it is he has it connected to. And then he started talking about ad revenue versus monetization. The reason I bring up the home stuff is because he just was really intelligent the way he spoke to that. Then he spoke about how Twitter missed an opportunity to monetize and they can really never monetize again other than ad revenue. And everything is going to ad revenue. Everything's going to the free model plus ad revenue. Right after that, and I'm going somewhere with this, but right after that, they then talked about how retail is failing and how it's consolidating on, under Amazon and Walmart.com and how everything is going to these two things. And I started thinking, what's going to happen to ad revenue? Like, is there a coming apocalypse where products are given for free at some point for ad revenue? If everything we use, every service we use is going is is free, is becoming free, right? Started with free shipping. Then it started with, you know, free memberships to all these things. And Amazon is still very successful in selling Prime. They continue to sell more Prime memberships. But it started with free shipping, where something would offer free shipping. And we all just assumed that shipping shipping was built into the cost somehow. But the generation behind us is so used to just scouring for a cheaper price. And then uh, a 20 something taught me a trick. And I may have mentioned this on the podcast before of when you want something, put it into the cart and then don't pay for it. And within days you'll get a discount. Like you'll get a coupon from the people who want you to close that deal. Right. Is there a time coming where the product is just free? Somebody sends me my converse for nothing in exchange for advertising. Is there going to be advertising on your shoes then? No, just like somebody pays Converse.com or whoever sent me the stuff. Like somebody pays Amazon.com for the advertising to give me a free product. Uh, (laughs) I mean, what's the end game of all this? And it got me all the way, and my brain does this sometimes, but it got me all the way to socialism is inevitable. The entire model is just inevitable as people look for more and more free things. Because now, even our commerce, even our capitalism, people look for it to be somewhat free. They look for the word free. The more the word free is in there, the less people, or the more people will go after that particular thing. Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, Well, that sounds like the fallacy of sunken costs. Go on. I, I don't know, I just heard that phrase where sunken costs are costs you can't get back. And um, if you don't believe that, then it's the fallacy of sunken cost. I'll probably cut this out as it's not interesting. All, all I know is I, I got my free fork. That was about the fork. Well, it's an, right. interesting, it's an interesting thing, right, Mike? Because you went there because of the fork, and the fork was free. I bet you would not have gone and bought the fork. No, I would never have bought the fork. But I, I, or the burger. Well, I had to buy the burger, but I got also a free fries and drink with it. So it actually wasn't a bad deal. And there are a lot of people there to get forks, but very disappointed. Not in the fork. The fork is just fun. You know what I'm disappointed? The fork, what was the point? You're supposed to put the french fries in it, and you can put the french fries in it, and you're supposed to mop up all the toppings that fall off your burger, right? Yeah, you put right. three, three french fries, or you could squeeze four in, right? Yeah, but here's the problem. No toppings fell off the burger. <laughs> so did you just find yourself eating fries out of the fork? Yeah, which makes you look very... <laughs> I, I guess I really don't mind looking that stupid. But <laughs> In front of the other 14-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, so I was expecting... Are, are you, all right, you, have you had a Big Mac recently, like in the last year? Yes, Bob? I have, yeah. All right, last time I had a Big Mac, actually all this, these toppings fell off of it. I yeah. could have used my fork for that. But on their new burgers, and now I, I, I went back, I had to go back the next day, and I th- I brought my fork back and I bought a different burger from their signature. They have three signature burgers. 
So I bought a different one to see. I was had fork in hand, and people were looking at me like, why are you back here actually carrying that fork? And I bought the different burger. I shoved fries in it, and I was waiting for toppings to fall off. And again, no toppings. No toppings fell off my burger, so I could not. I always fall off a Big Mac. Yeah, that's why the fork is designed for a Big Mac. They should have done the fork with the Big Mac thing instead of the fork with the signature burgers because the signature burgers are so neatly assembled, you don't have any toppings fall off. Mm -hmm. I found a flaw in their model. (sighs) Maybe yours was made wrong. Like maybe that's why I went back. They were just light on the toppings on yours. I went back a second time to validate that. And no, same outcome, two times in a row. I'd recommend using your uh, fork at a Yum Brands restaurant. Is that legal? Because stuff always falls out of my Taco Bell. That's is your fork, like, has it been sustained? Is it reusable? Yes. Like, what's it made of? Like, rubbery plastic kind of stuff. Rubbery plastic kind of stuff. Yeah. So I can, I can continue to use I mean, I might have this the rest of my life. But I don't know how I bring it to like Taco Bell because they don't sell fries at Taco Bell. So what, what am I actually going to insert into Fork unless I go get fries first and then go to Taco Bell to order a taco? And then that would be very weird with me eating French fries and tacos. It seems logical to me. Nobody's buying the Vicks yet, really. Yeah, I'm buying the Vicks. You're buying the Vicks, but... Mm-hmm. It was down to nine fifty six this week. Yeah, we got a one point spike, but not enough to make any money off of. <laughs> right, a one point spike. Yeah, we got up to ten. <laughs> it's now trading ten fifty. Woo! <laughs> I mean, we touched on this on the path on the uh, path chats, which uh, what was this like twenty? It hit twenty year lows or something. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. I have to call it the chart again. I'm going to go to my 20-year. All right, the lowest low was 939, but we closed actually at a lower, the lowest level in like 24 years. So we didn't make a new all-time low, but we closed at the lowest level in 24 years on the fix, ah, which seems absolutely insane. And we talked about crude last week. With uh, I made the call for the short-term capitulation bottom. And we've we've rallied up nicely into our rotation zone. We have. We have. I mean, what we were trading right around the forty six area when we talked about that. Now we're up to nearly forty eight. We hit above forty eight yesterday. So that worked out nicely. Back to the breakdown zone. So that's that's our recap from sort of last week. And Christopher wrote in. What Christopher said. He said, great podcast, great conversation, good depth, especially on the SEC. You guys make total sense. I hope the SEC is listening. And he, oh, I got to skip. He totally agrees with Stafford that uh, Elon Musk needs to write a children's book. (laughs) So, and then podcast listeners who I ran into this week complained that Stafford was buying foreign made yo yo's. Okay, let's go fast. Okay, um, if you're learning to play the guitar, you do not buy a $3,000 Paul Reed Smith with inlays. I'm not a good yo-yoer. I'm very much of a basics. So I wanted to buy some inexpensive yo-yos to see if this hobby would stick. So it was just me being a fiscal conservative type of person. There you go. You could have bought an American-made guitar. Oh, yeah, I got lots of guitars, but I'm, I've been playing guitar for 25 years. No, but, you know, well, you know, when somebody happens to buy a Paul Reed Smith with inlays, they might want the American-made guitar. Yeah, but if you can't play a pentatonic minor at, you know, 4-4 four four and... I don't need to play Penn and Teller minor. <laughs> <laughs> so that was improv. <laughs> Not when you say that right afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that wasn't a problem. Yeah, and I found something on uh, Kickstarter for you, Bob, Ooh. this week. What's that? A cell phone case that makes you espresso. What? Mo case. It's called Mo case. M O K A S E. It's a phone case that doubles in the, as an espresso. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Spell that again. M O K A S E. Mo case. 
M O K A S E Mocha. Yes. Look it up on Kickstarter. What the h- is this? I found it for you. Here's one headline. This coffee-making iPhone case might be the worst thing mankind ever created. No, I found something else that we'll get to next, but this I thought... Oh, hold on. I don't know. Maybe the atomic bomb in the 40s was more a little bit serious, but... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you had to go there. Really? <laughs> Doubles as a portable coffee machine. What? <laughs> yeah. How can this be? And it starts at only $54 if you back it on Kickstarter. I don't care if it's $5,400. I'm getting you, one. You could actually have espresso anytime you want. Oh, my God. There's a screen thing. Did you see the video? I Everyone know. go fund this thing. <laughs> I don't know. 50 to 60 degrees Celsius next to my face. I'm not too happy with that. <laughs> So look how happy Bob is now because this actually... cannot be real. It is real. It can't be. It is real. You don't understand I... though. It can't be. Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. I love it so much. No. Now here's what you don't. All right. If the Mo case, what is the funding right now on it? A thin coffee capsule fits inside a custom case which contains beans and water required to make a delicious shot of Java. (laughs) This is insane. Okay. Now, here's something you don't need. The crowdfunded smart pillow. So you you can pay $300 for a pillow that knows when you're sleeping and when you're awake. It's these people backed it for more than $50,000. It's got embedded color-changing LED lights flip on in the mornings to both rouse you from a slumber and display customizable wake-up messages. <laughs> the pillow incorporates a gyroscope and accelerometer monitor, how often you toss and turn. It plays wireless music through a Bluetooth connection as well as a variety of white noises. And it can guide you through meditation sessions. Once again, I don't, don't need the electricity right next to my face. <laughs> Um, <laughs> quick update on the Mo case. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so far, four thousand two hundred and twenty-nine euros of a pledge goal of seventy-five thousand euros. Ninety backers. Uh, funding suspended. Funding for this project was suspended by Kickstarter four days ago. Why? I don't. It's no explanation. <sighs> The funny thing is, is it's it's an Italian product. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, it's an Italian product. Grazie per il tutto supporto. Entry a fa parte della comunità di Mocase. Uh, so basically it says thanks for your support and you will be part of the Mocase commu- community. Yeah, the Giornatos community. And receive exclusive updates from us. Maybe it's just all a big Italian bank bailout scam. Could be. Could be Mario Draghi's behind this. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, you mentioned, uh, well, first of all, Apple stock. I think it, it market cap was above $800 billion for the first time this week. But you talked about Apple with their wearables and how they were going to like sort of master that market, Bob. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Now, the Apple Watch outsold every other wearable last quarter. Mm-hmm. Uh so there you go. It's shipped 3.5 million wearables in the first quarter of 2017, 59% higher than 2.2 million devices it did in the same previous last year. It's sort of eating Fitbit's lunch right now. And this is sort of fascinating. This popped up this morning. AI-equipped Apple Watch can detect the signs of a stroke. So wow. in conjunction with the app maker cardiogram, which actually I have on my watch, it will track your heartbeat and everything else. They determined that the iWatch, when paired with the neural network algorithms, is 97% accurate in detecting arterial fibrillation, the most common type of heart rhythm problems. So they're really do they studied 6,158 Apple Watch users via the cardiogram app, and 200 had an existing AF conditions that made their hearts beat erratically. And then the engineers use those subjects to train a deep learning system to ter- to discern patients with arrhythmia versus those with normal heartbeats. They then tested the system on 51 patients scheduled for a procedure to restore normal heart rate rhythms. All use the Apple Watch and 
12 lead EEG prior to and after the procedure and the AI algorithm and the Apple Watch were able to identify the the irregular heartbeat with 97% accuracy and 98% sensitivity according to the study. That is very interesting because we've already talked about, you know, how they're going to try mm. to detect the the uh glucose level in the blood and now it can possibly monitor your heart for you know, it's possible hey alert you you're something going on with your heart this could lead to stroke you might as well you better go get something checked so it's actually like a check engine light on the yeah. car mm-hmm. i wonder how many people will ignore that as much as they do the check engine light oh i check i check my heart rate results every day every morning sometimes a few times a day yeah yep i, I think it's good you know I think if your watch alerts you with like some big pop up, pop, pop, <laughs> might, <laughs> might might be having a stroke. Yeah, stroke imminent. That a lot of people will say <laughs> I might want to pay attention to that one. As long as they don't have a thing that says stroke imminent, stop drinking espresso. So that would be the worst thing. So you were you I think you're onto something with Apple trying their these wearables and Apple everything. I think doing. about. Think about the money involved in healthcare, and think about the money involved in pharmaceuticals and, and biotech and all that. And if Apple is able to take their existing user base and convert them to, I don't want to say healthier people, but maybe safer people based on wearables, I mean, it's massive. Apple's services business is already bigger than McDonald's. I mean, it's like, and now they tackle something like this, tie it into their, what do they call that? The Apple universe. Um, there's a word for it that's escaping me right now, but you just you just stay part of the network. It becomes part of your life. It becomes everything you are. When when they if they get into health and then they're getting in the prevention side, which there's just not enough people with any credibility in. I think it's great. Yeah, it's so you were you were spot on with mm-hmm. with that one and where that could be headed. Quick in our ever unfolding battle between Walmart and Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a, some information released on Walmart's uh, Internet of Things patent application takes aim at the Amazon Dash. Do you know what the Amazon Dash is? I do not. It's you can buy these little dash buttons. They actually credit you when it, they cost like four ninety nine, but you essentially get the four ninety nine back when you place your first dash order. You link a product to it, so it could be like paper towels, and you stick it somewhere in the kitchen cabinet, or like laundry detergent, and you stick it on the front of your uh, laundry machine. And when you're running low, you can just hit the button, and it automatically, without you doing anything, will you know you're a Prime member. It'll hey, he needs more laundry detergent or she needs more laundry detergent. And then the laundry detergent just show up at your house, you know, and whatever shipping time or... It, y- y- young children love pressing that dash button like it's a video game. And that's a lot of laundry <laughs> detergent. <laughs> so well, hopefully uh, they'll put a fingerprint sensor in there at some point. So you can like, you can get it for your bags of Cheetos and everything else. You are your pr- Pringles or so they have all these different kinds of buttons for whatever you could want. Uh, this is... You know, once the drone works, this will work for your toilet paper thing. When you realize you've at the most inappropriate time, you've run out of toilet paper, you could press the dash button. The drone would just drop it off for you through the window. Uh, so Walmart, though, is working on these patents sort of like the dash, but it's actually going to be sort of embedded into the products. And so it will detect when it's running out and it can automatically reorder things for you. You know, it's. <laughs> like these products are connected to the internet and everything else. And hey, you're just running low on toilet paper. Your toilet paper will show up from Walmart. <laughs> wow. So you don't even have to push the button. So you can you can be sort of off in space and realize that you you were down to your last uh, roll of uh, brawn brawny uh brawny paper towels brawn yeah and it, all of a sudden the paper towels show up at your door the next day the brawny paper towels uh, uh do not have um the brawny man on them anymore by the way why not because it's now a girl that's <laughs> i have no comment yes let's move on <laughs> now speaking of girls or, or bob this is for you the mm-hmm. handbag real retailers coach and kate spade just for you they're Agreed to merge $2.4 billion deal in which Coach will acquire Kate Spade. 
you know, this also ties into sort of the retail apocalypse and malls and everything else. But Coach and Kate Spade are tying the the knot. Yeah, that's a good one. That is. So do you have any comments on this? Do you think it's going to? Yeah, they're both, uh, you know, the female population that I interact with. Both Coach and Kate Spade have lost sort of their their um, – Cachet. What's the word? Yeah, they're cachet. They're higher. They're they're not viewed as a luxury good anymore. Like everything is Louis Vuitton for these women now, and you know it's just the higher end is now the high end, right? So Coach and Kate Spade have lost their cachet. They're just looked down upon. So them merging to actually come out with some new products or to take a bigger chunk out of like the the lower end like they're all in target now and they're big in tj maxx and things like that and for them to take a bigger chunk out of this is a good move by those guys because they weren't going anywhere alone they don't have the cachet of michael coors or the other guys who who can hold their own in stocks as stocks i should say you just rattled off a whole bunch of names that i don't know <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> what what not sure why you said the purses were for me but i do understand fashion better than you well, that's what I was saying. This is your segment. I can't comment on it. You know, I the only thing I ever go to in a mall is an Apple store. Or I have a I actually have a, a good coach story, uh, courtesy of my brother in law. He uh, just surrounded by immigrants in my family, right? So my sister married a guy whose parents are also immigrants and t- from Italy, and he once, when we were younger showed up at a family party and he owed me like 10 bucks for something. So he pulled out his wallet and his father goes, well, where'd you get it out of wallet? And he says, oh, I just got it, dad. It's coach. It's great. How much you pay for it? And he goes, $80. He pulls out of his pocket this broken down wallet that was like frayed and old and was made of leatherette. I mean, it was just, the thing was awful. He goes, I paid $10 for this one. I got $70 inside. One of my favorite wallet stories ever. You paid $80 for that wallet. I paid $10 for this one. I got $70 inside of it. (laughs) Love that story. I still got my Velcro wallet from 1984. God, you would. You know those Velcro? Like, oh, those are the best. One of the most annoying things ever is standing in a line and hearing that Velcro <laughs> unfasten for somebody to get their stuff out of you. Like, it's like, oh, my, I have to expect this guy's credit card to get declined. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you then what kind of wallet I carry anymore. I don't carry a wallet anymore. Speaking of wallets, what's the uh, crude update for the week? Goldman Sachs thinks the market is already in balance, uh, possibly moving into further balance or into deficit, rather. Uh, I read a very interesting article where this guy, his last name's Curie. I don't remember his first name right now. Might be John or Jeff, Jeff Curie, maybe. But anyway, he's a, he's a lead commodity analyst at Goldman Sachs, wrote a piece talking about how the EIA crude data is a lagging indicator because it's the most transparent because there's weekly figures and the figures are reliable, uh, it ends up being a lagging in indicator of where the market's actually going because oversupply and undersupply actually happens first in some of the OPEC countries and some of the other um, overseas supply shops. So his contention was, is that from the data, the anecdotal evidence he's getting there, those are already in deficit, which is why we're seeing larger crude draws here He said, you can see that in the export figures. Then I read an article from another shop whose name escapes me that said, and this one I kind of agree with more, that said, while crude may have a summer pop to it, we're in a sort of irreversible trend and it's OPEC's fault. Now, I think it's a little naive to assume that OPEC was taken by surprise by the huge build in U.S. shale. Um, they've been controlling the price of oil for 40 years with words and deeds. And it just seems to me that they wouldn't be shocked by the idea that, oh, my God, they just ramped up their U.S. production estimate in their OPEC report by 64 percent. It seems, again, odd to me that this consortium that has been running oil prices, been manipulating oil prices for some 30 to 40 years, all of a sudden was shocked by the level of U.S. production. They missed it by 64 percent. 
I think that that's all a ploy to extend cuts and possibly even increase them. I think what's happening now is that they're trying to keep oil in a sweet spot where they can make money and Saudi Arabia breaks even at less than $10 in some places where they can make money, build, continue to build up their coffers and shale doesn't go absolutely bananas with production because as shale came offline, prices rallied and to the point where shale could then come back online. So for them to actually keep prices at a level is probably their only option at this point because U.S. production is not going away. So I think we're going to see a, a pretty decent range trade here now for a while again, but more in between that 40 to 50 area than that 50 to 60 or 45 to 55 area. So about $5 lower. I think it's inevitable that they at least extend the cuts and they'll probably push them into 2018. The last thing I'll say is I can't see compliance continuing from some of the other countries. While Saudi Arabia may have this incredible national balance sheet, the other countries don't. Venezuela doesn't, Libya doesn't, Nigeria doesn't, Iran doesn't. So, and neither does Russia. So these producers will begin to cheat on the production cuts, even though I think OPEC will agree to that or extend them rather. So, and that's what I think. Well, Bloomberg analysis came out this morning and said only Kuwait, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Venezuela complied with agreed upon OPEC output cuts in April. Yeah, but they also announced that compliance said 102% of the agreed upon cut. And it's well known that Saudi Arabia is picking up the slack. So they're 2% higher than their agreed upon production cut. That, again, tells me Saudi Arabia wants this cut to go through. They want it to happen. And it is starting to show a little bit of fruit in inventories. I mean, this 5 million draw. And, yeah, the the gasoline inventories was higher than the market expected. But we now have five weeks in a row of draws at the EIA. And this week was 5 million. So we'll see if that continues. But for this particular set of data, that's almost a trend already. Well, and Morgan Stanley came out this week and said the U.S. rig count increased by 7.3 rigs per week over the last 52 weeks, making this the strongest recovery of the last 30 years. Now, to tie that in with the cool tech segment, we have the self-repairing roads that can also charge your electric car. Say that again. I'm sorry. (laughs) Self-repairing roads that could charge your electric car. Wait, what? They're testing self-repairing roads that could charge your electric car. The uh, well, That sounds like two things. So the road repairs itself and it charges your car? Yes. This is, so uh, there, years ago, along the lines of, of the YGM killed the electric car type of conspiracy, there was a machine that was invented, and I want to say it was invented in the 70s. And I know this anecdotally because I know somebody at a very large, very connected highway construction company here in Illinois. And he was an older guy and he said, yeah, they, he goes, we killed this thing. It was a machine that laid down road on the back end of it, broke up the road on the front end of it, collected the debris in the middle with three guys that could do the work that it took 30 guys to do. And it could do like a mile of road in a day. And literally all these construction workers would have been out of work. And this particular company would have lost a ton of contracts. So they killed it. They like, bought it from the guy, threatened him, did all this stuff. This is a a true myth, if I could call it that. So now this is something that might happen. Is that that plastic road thing? No, there are plans to test self-repairing asphalt whose conductive steel fibers and bacteria would fix both small cracks in the pavement and send electricity to the electrical vehicles above. You'd need to have your electric vehicle equipped with a wireless charging thing, but then the healing requires an induction machine that generates enough heat in both the asphalt and the fibers to trigger the repair process. And they're projecting it would cost 25% more than just putting in a normal road. So while the asphalt's healing this minor cracks uh, and then you're stopped at stoplights, it also can help wirelessly charge your electric vehicle. Thought that was very, very interesting. I do not welcome our bacteria sentient road overlords. 
Well, you can just stick with your gas car and and have to fill it up manually because I'm going for the bacteria. I think we need more bacteria in the roads here in Chicago because there's so many cracks in them. <laughs> Is there any chance that electric cars will ever just like have a soundtrack of a combustion engine playing? Because it's got to love that sound. Do. Yeah, that's that's mandated by the federal government at under 15 miles an hour, they have to make some sort of audible noise. My brother has a Z06, a Corvette Z06, and when he drives away and it is just like, oh, that sounds so wonderful. Is it, does the Z06 have the real sound or is it like the Ford Mustang that actually pumps out the sound? They actually. <laughs> the Z06 has both. It has butterfly valves in the exhaust <laughs> to actually create a tuned exhaust that's artificial. It's a really cool sound. Speaking of really cool sounds, what sound did Snap make this week? This is our IPO. We got their first earnings report. What did you think of it, Bob? Uh, it was not good. So I saw, I'm going to go with the positive first. They still grew. User base. That's it. <laughs> That's the positive. Okay, one more positive thing. Facebook also had some really bad numbers in their first couple of reports. And we all saw what happened with Facebook. Facebook is a must own now. So uh, the, the difference between Snap and Facebook that I think might be lost on some people who are fans of the stock, which Mike and I are not, they had no competition. Snap does. And it's called Facebook. So it's just not, doesn't. It's not good. Was that it? That's it. That's all I got for you. That's it. Well, the, so their uh, daily average users came in at 166 million reported versus 167 million expected by the street. Uh, revenue came in at 150 million versus 158 expected. So, yes, yeah, so the revenue did go up, but. Uh, nah, not what was expected. They lost two dollars and thirty one cents per share, but they said most of that was due to expenses related to stock-based compensation. So it, it just wasn't good overall. It, it traded down to 17.59 as we speak, 18.30 would not be, we put up a video this week on our path chat, would not be rushing out to buy this. If it does rally up, we're looking at some pretty significant resistance right around the 19.50 area to the 1984 so that would be actually if we were turned up there a possible uh short play but nothing good for snap it sort of fell over speaking of also disney came out this week they didn't do so hot either good <laughs> they ruined star wars and keep ruining it, ruining it i like the new star wars once again, you're not a real fan. <laughs> who, who, who was? What is Palpatine's first name? Do you even know that? Mr. Michael? Palpatine, M Michelle, oh, no, I think. No, no, no. He's French, right? She Sheev. Oh wait, Sheev. is it a she or is his name Sheev? Sheev Palpatine. Okay, and I know Padme. Padme Amidala, sure. Mm -hmm. Ah, I feel like I'm going rogue on this one. I have another story. Uh oh. <laughs> Is it Disney related or Star Wars? <laughs> no, I just re I used to go to this. Uh, I used to, it's Star Wars related somewhat. It was just one of the. You know what? You guys are gonna find it funny, but you kind of had to be there. I used to go to this cleaners uh, when I lived in uh, Roscoe Village. It's a neighborhood in Chicago, Roscoe Village, and there was this cleaners, and they had what I assumed to be a daughter, a relative of some sort, working there. And she was always really, really nice, but she was just really dorky, right? She's a really dorky person, but super nice. And I remember going there on Halloween to pick up some clothing, to pick up some stuff I'd left there. And I said to her, you know, just chit chat while she's waiting for the stuff to come down. I said, so are you dressing up for anything as Halloween? She goes, oh, no, I'm not allowed to do that in this family. They're just too strict. I'm not allowed to go out on Halloween. I have to come straight home after work. My mother waits for me, drives me home, tells me the whole story about how so strict it was. And then all of a sudden, as she hands me my clothes, she goes, but if I did, I'd be Princess Amidala from Star Wars. And the way she said it still sticks in my head because I remember having to go home and Yahoo it because I used to Yahoo then. I had to go home and Yahoo who Princess Amidala from Star Wars was. And then I spent the whole night imagining, like, the white line and the lips and, I don't know, red line, whatever it was. Just weird. Uh, those those 
early movies are harkening back to the 1900s to the you know the the gilded <laughs> age the golden age while the later movies meaning the early, the 4 5 6 with the empire and the death star the the non disney movies those are more of uh, modern war talking about how a republic turns into an empire which relates to our history um, it's actually quite quite deep and quite intelligent well, Disney needs to dig a little deeper because they only came in with thirteen point three four billion in revenue versus ex- expectations of thirteen point four five. Adjusted earnings per share came in higher, one point five versus expected one point four one. They are increasing their two thousand seventeen share buybacks by two billion to as much as ten billion. Their stock has dropped from one sixteen down. Right now, it's trading at one oh nine. Now, and actually, I like good. Disney. Got a lot of superhero movies coming up. Yep, Disney owns Marvel, right? Not all of Marvel. Sony owns Spider Man, right? But Marvel Studios is owned by Disney, right? Yes. And then Sony owns Spider Man, but they're allowing they're doing a, they're allowing them to use it for this new Spider Man Homecoming. I like Disney stock going into the release of these Marvel movies. They've got Thor Ragnarok coming out. Oh, so you, you're an Infinity War fan. I, I'm not. I'm. I'm a Marvel fan. I. I had tons of comics, and I basically had Batman and Marvel, just bat all Batman and Marvel comics, and that's it. Couldn't stand the, most of the DC universe, but I was always a huge Hulk fan. I was always a huge Spider-Man fan. So I have a yeah Iron Man fan and Avengers. I had Avengers one. It's one of the things my mom was like. I threw out that box of magazines you had. I'm like, wait, what? And it was my comics. And in there was an Avengers 1. Quick Mo Case update. It's still suspended. Uh-huh. Let's look up <laughs> what Avengers 1 is worth. I'm gonna I, guess my mom I'm gonna guess my mom threw away five hundred dollars. What do you think? So so I have like lots of my comics and they're in pristine condition. And I went ahead and got them all digital, so I don't even take them out of the plastic containers anymore. So I read all my classic Thors, all my X-Factors with Scott Summers and Gene Gray. And I tell you, going digital with comics, that's that's the way to go. Really? I sold all mine. I had I had all the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. and I, I have Punisher 1 through 4. I had Punisher, <laughs> and I had uh, Judge Dredd, the whole series. $103 for Avengers 1. Ah. <sighs> There's our uh, now Dis. So you like Disney? I'm actually thinking Disney. If it gets a close above 110, is going to do a little quick gap fill for a trade. But we'll see. Why is Avengers five thirteen hundred dollars? Yeah, no, I just like it going into all these Marvel movies because they'll they'll do fantastic. They they always do. Sometimes they're 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 misprints. And the misprints get corrected in uh, an earlier print, yeah. a later printing. So that's why certain comics may have particular values because um, they had to, you know, retool uh, mm-hmm. the, the print job. Interesting. Now, now to a positive earnings report this week, Nvidia. Yeah, that shocked a lot of people. I think they were a lot of people were looking at that to be bad. Company reported 79 cents EPS on 1.94 billion in revenue. Beating the consensus of sixty-six cents EPS and one point nine one billion in revenue. This is two billion a quarter. This is a great company. More importantly, Nvidia's revenue was up forty-eight percent from a year ago, while Gap, generally accepted accounting principles, EPS was up one hundred twenty-six percent. So Nvidia actually reported a number up one hundred twenty-six percent that was done by generally accepted accounting principles. That was reals, not fakels. <laughs> not fakels. <laughs> it was real. So. Here's an off-white Avengers one for twelve thousand five hundred. I'm doing the Newman thing right now from Seinfeld and saying "Mom" with that Newman fist. Sorry, that's an inside joke with myself. So that's a really inside joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think of uh, the chart on Nvidia? I haven't looked at it. Nvidia? Yeah. It's. I mean, it's it's honest. I would not chase it here. It could. Uh, it could use a little backfilling it before earnings. It was trading at about one Oh three. Now it's about it's one thirty. that it traded a high to one thirty. So yeah, this, is a, this is a great buy. If it gets back to one Oh five, one Oh six, but it'd be diff, 
hard I, pressed to find. It's actually good. I would be looking to pick this up at, if it pulled back to about the 120 mark. Okay. We get the rising rotation zone on the daily. It would return to a break key breakout re level, which was resistance. We had major resistance at 120. It blew through that. So if it pulls back there nicely, it could be a nice rotation trade. That yeah, I see that. I see that significant level now. So we're in accumulation mode of NVIDIA, I would say. Yes. 120, around 111, then again around 105. Yeah, I, this is not a... Accumulate not, NVIDIA. I like that one. Do you want to know a stock I'm not accumulating? Yeah. Yep. I hate when you do that. <laughs> I just hate it. <laughs> It's the worst. Uh, well, why don't you? Oh, is it worse than their earnings? No, their earnings were bad. Adjusted loss of six cents per share on revenue of one hundred and ninety-seven point three million. Did they lose less or more than was expected? <clears throat> they posted an adjusted loss of six cents per share, which was smaller than the eight cents per share expected. Um, by a Reuters survey, consensus estimate. But the revenue fell short. They were looking for 198.3 million. And again, 197.3 was what they came out with. But the lower than expected revenue is expected to drag on. Essentially, they had negative guidance. The company's forecasting second quarter revenues of 202 million to 206 million and full year revenues of 850 to 865. That's below what the street was looking for, which was 215, and full year revenue of 889. Same survey by Thomson Reuters. So shares fell. God, they were down 28% when I looked at them. Yeah, that, this is this is one on any rallies I'm looking to sh short. <laughs> mm -hmm. Especially if it were to rally back to the 31 to 32 area with the declining rotation zone prior support becoming resistance. That's this is not one I'm looking to buy at all. And another company I'm not looking to buy for our final earnings recap is Hertz. <laughs> oh, Hertz. This Hertz, actually, this chart. Last August of 2016, it was trading at 53.14. Now it's trading 10.91. Wow. They are just burning money. Hertz reported a First quarter net loss from continuing operations of $223 million or $2.69 a share. And that includes $30 million of impairment charges. This loss is over four times greater compared to the $52 million it lost in quarter one of last year. <laughs> That's not heading in the right direction. Uh, is, it, is it true that the only reason that uh, car rental companies make money is they hold a car for three months, four months, six months, and then they turn it on the market, and that's how they make their profit? And now the car market is so saturated, the used car market so saturated that they can't turn those cars? Well, they, they blamed an unfavorable customer mix. I don't know, but see, they're in a rock and a hard place because now a lot of people are they're in a rock and hard place. Ubering instead of renting cars, and then they, I Stafford did touch on something with they can't. The used car market is in disarray right now, so anything they would take these cars off of the rental and try to sell them, they're they're getting hit there too. They're getting hit left and right. You know what the biggest thing when I ever look to rent a car that's more frustrating is the taxes and fees cost more than the car rental itself. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like, go try to rent a car from O'Hare. You could get the car, you know, oh, look, I can get this. Uh, I can get a deal from Hertz for a midsize car for only $28 a day. And then you look at what it's going to be with taxes and fees. It's now up to like 60 something. So you're paying more in taxes and fees than Hertz is making on their rental car. It is silly. And with Uber and Lyft being in pretty much every city anyone would go to, I mean, you could get it in the suburbs of all the major cities. You can get it everywhere. So what do you need a car for? I mean, especially if you're visiting family or something where you're like, look, I'm going to rent a car because I might want to go shopping while you're at work, whatever. And now people are like, well, I'll just Uber if I want to go somewhere. It, it's just it's completely. And then there's zip car as well. There yep. used to be a lot of people in the cities who didn't own cars that would then rent cars to go grocery shopping and things like that. And they use Zipcar now instead. That's where there were always rental car, uh, like desks and parking garages filled with Hertz. And, and uh, that was the whole thing of, of Enterprise was they would bring you the car. 
which was how enterprise grew is the we'll pick you up thing. But now it would not surprise me to see one of these companies turn into, you know, kind of a mini Lyft. Maybe kind of Lyft. should just rent out their cars to Lyft and Uber drivers. <laughs> well, Lyft made a made a deal with GM, so that's interesting. But yeah, I mean, why wouldn't they do that, right? Because they need to they need to figure out a, how their business model is going to fit with everything going on now. Because I, it's not something I'd be. This is not a stock I'd be looking to buy at all until they can figure out a new business model. Yeah, I think I think some of these auto rental companies are just a dumping ground for the automakers. Just dump their to increase their yeah to increase their numbers for you know vehicles because it's mostly American automakers who who go to uh, rental car companies and they have you know big oh look how many cars we've sold this year really two thirds of them went to a rental car company. Wow. Well, there you go now. <laughs> Speaking of cars, we can go to Elon's, which goes way beyond cars, but uh, Elon's Playhouse. <laughs> There's been a lot of articles this week about Elon Musk employs unusual market plan for Model 3 anti-selling, how he's uh, he keeps reiterating the that the Model 3 is not superior to the Model S, and so you, you Model S will always be a better car than the Model 3 because it's a more expensive car. So keep focusing on the Model S. The Model 3 is just uh, a cheaper car. It's not going to be as technologically advanced. He's really stressing that. I, I Maybe the buyer curve, he's worried about it shifting down too much, which is interesting. What else was there? Oh, it's not an unusual strategy. I mean, Porsche did that when they reintroduced the Boxster years ago. They did the same thing. They said that the, uh, you know, the 911 will always be a superior car. They were they were stressing that over and over because when they came out with the Boxster S, there was a lot of the car magazines basically saying, "Why would you buy a 911 now?" Yeah, but now they've they've have realized that the Boxster with the mid engine is much better mm -hmm. on the track. So the Boxster high-end versions will crush a 911. I'm just saying that they they the strategy's not new. It's been done no, before. It's not, not like Elon inv invented this. He did not invent it. He's just using the, he's talking down the Model 3, talking up the Model S. Interesting, though, that the Model S and X is now, they're, uploading with these they have these sensors and the cameras on them and everything else so they're uploading the short video clips from the external cameras to help tesla with the autonomous driving so they're i guess it's doing it anonymously it can't be tied to any specific car but you know as you're driving around it, the car's taking videos and uploading it to, to the tesla engineers so they can uh use that to help improve the their autonomous driving program, you know, it's looking for road markings and other videos that they can run through probably some AI and uh, help train the self-driving system. So if you own these cars, be aware. Wouldn't that also help Tesla's liability in a crash that's not the car's fault? They can't. They're actually not tying it to the I guess they could pull the video. I don't think they're uploading that automatically, but if I believe if there is an is if the Tesla is involved in an accident, they can pull the video from the car itself, which then is, okay, we have a reason to pull it and not make it anonymous because we're trying to figure out what happened. In big news this week, <laughs> they uh, they finally announced their price link. You can pre-order their solar panel roofs, which you put down a $1,000 deposit. Well, that sounds very <laughs> Again, raising cash. Uh -huh. <laughs> please order our roofs. Now, they came out and said a 1,700-square-foot roof in Southern California with half the roof covered in active solar tiles would cost about $34,000 after federal tax credit. I, I, They have a little tool online that you can punch in your stuff. It actually partners with Google uh, to sort of figure out your footprint of your roof and everything else. So I ran it for my house. And okay. Let me get the numbers. Based off my home square footage and what's required, the amount of electricity and the cost of energy and the cost of the roof and the size of the roof. Let's see, where's my, so. 
Where'd the numbers go? Oh, the cost of the roof would cost me $62,500. And remember, he said this was not going to be much more than an average roof. Well, the cost to re-roof this house was uh, $10,000 uh, a couple years ago. Now, yeah. this roof's going to cost $62,500. It's also going to cost me another $7,000 for a power wall battery. However, I'm going to get 18100 in tax credits. Now, my net savings over – or my net cost over 30 years to put in this roof, I'm going to get back uh, – let's see – Fifty thousand two hundred of value of energy back, but it cost me sixty. So essentially, my net cost over thirty years is twelve hundred dollars to put this roof on my house. Over thirty years. <laughs> over thirty years. <laughs> wow. So I'm be now. What's not in this is if I took my sixty two thousand five hundred dollars and invested it in something. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Elon to finance it. Yeah, if he finances it at zero percent interest. For yeah. 30 years. Yeah. And it's transferable to a new homeowner. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Then you can do it. Then I'll do it. Otherwise, yeah. I'm not seeing how any of this makes sense. I actually wanted to run it for my own house to see how much little sense it made, and it makes no sense. <laughs> None at all. I don't – he's going to be – and it wouldn't – especially wouldn't make sense in Chicago where like half the year it's cloudy. <laughs> right. And if you take away the federal tax credits, I mean, he if he lost federal tax credits, his businesses would hurt. I mean, I was watching people run their numbers for Southern California, and the only way you come out ahead is with that federal tax credit. If that was not in existence, you'd lose money over your 30 years. But he is very creative with his products. Well, yeah, no, he is. He's very creative. He just also relies on federal tax credits a lot. <laughs> I was going to say that's going to be the next thing. What? Is that they're going to get a full tax credit, like literally a full tax credit for this roof. Well, if they're going to give me a full it tax won't be, It won't be in the next three and a half years, but. Well, all right. If they're gonna, the federal government's going to pay for my new roof, then I might have put up one of his roofs. Right, right. I still don't like federal tax credits, but can't do anything about it. <laughs> and then you're that person in the neighborhood that has that roof. That have that roof. Yeah, there are a lot of solar panel roofs around no, here. No, but it does. It, it doesn't look terrible. Like solar panel. I mean, the roof. I will admit, looks very good. Since it's all built in, it, you, you, the roofs actually look pretty cool. It's not like with these big ugly solar panels on top of it. But it's nowhere near the cost that you said, oh, it's not going to cost much more than your standard roof. Well, it will cost me six times as much as my standard roof. Yeah, your health care will cost as much as a phone bill. <laughs> yeah, with long-distance charges to wear. <laughs> I don't know. Some guy said that some long time ago. <laughs> now, cryptocurrency segment. This is going to be very brief, but I thought this was interesting. In Fed remarks this week from Kashikari, he said blockchain is more promising than Bitcoin. And blockchain, again, is the technology behind a lot of these cryptocurrencies and especially behind Bitcoin. But he's obviously not a fan of the Bitcoin, which is now, I think, hit a high of 1740 this week. Again, I'd still, if I wanted to get something, be buying a little gold versus Bitcoin, because I think something's disastrous at some point is going to happen to Bitcoin. But the Fed's now talking about blockchains and Bitcoins, so... We'll see how that's going to end up. But I do agree. The uh, the technology, because a lot of companies, a lot of private companies are now putting a lot of R&D and future programming tools into using blockchains, especially banks for uh, wire transfers and everything else. I think blockchain is really going to revolutionize a lot in the banking industry. Because it prevents fraud, right? Yep. There's an auditable... Uh, trail that no one person can sort of fudge. You know, it's it's so many you couldn't, you can't fake it, else the transaction doesn't go through. So without the audit trail, there is no transaction. So you can't, and you can't go back and then rejig the audit trail. Is a blockchain kind of an analysis of like um, a huge line of train cars, and each uh, you know freight train car gets put onto the train? And that's one transaction, and another one gets locked up. So they're all in sequence in order like that? Well, it's, yes. It, yes, but it's also somewhat fractal in nature. So 
it's it's some of the ways it's this it doesn't have to go in a linear fashion it can branch out but it's always traceable to the sequence of things how it branched out so it's quite fascinating the way uh, some of this even the advanced blockchain and stuff is working now very very interesting just thought that tied in because we had a lot of fed speak this week so thought i'd tie it together we have tons of fed speak including this morning evans has been rattling on but okay still suspended Really? Yeah. Could you? I think you need to contact Italy and find out what's going on. I would contact Kickstarter. Tell them I just want one. Just why don't you contact the inventor and say I'll just buy your prototype? That's your MoCase update. Okay, thank you. Well, your some U.S. economy segment numbers: wholesale inventories came out plus 0.2 percent in March. Estimated they were supposed to be down 0.1 percent. Uh, producer price index, principal highest estimate of 0.5% month over month. Expected 0.2%, last was negative 0.1%. Retail sales came in 0.4%, expected 0.6%, so that was a big miss. And retail sales less autos rose 0.3% versus an estimated 0.5%. So retail sales across the board missed a downside. Consumer price index came in at 2.2% to 2.3%. And in our latest, before we get to the Fed speakers, in our latest Fed Watch update tools, the New York Fed cuts the Q2 GDP to 1.8 from 2.3. I think they're a bit on the low side. Atlanta Fed cuts, they you know their famous Fed Now Me tool that we always talk about, was at 4.2, now down to 3.6. There's your Fed Watch numbers for uh, Q2. Now there's tons of Fed speak this week. Anything that caught your eye, Bob? No, not really. I mean, the sort of the, cum, the accumulation of the Fed speak is what caught my eye is they're basically still talking the company line. And I mentioned it last week, and my opinion remains the same. If they're wrong that this slowdown is transitory, and I'll say that so far the jobs numbers are good. The first quarter jobs numbers are really good. And the, the numbers for that have April listed on them for Europe are good as well. There's still some March data trickling in, but... Uh, Q2 is looking good. I'd say these retail numbers are the weakest of the numbers that have come out so far. So they're still talking the company line. They're basically talking about shrinking the balance sheet, raising rates. So there's no one line that caught my eye. No. Well, Bullard, yeah, he was saying uh, he was talking about trimming the balance sheet in the second half. He's He sees the current Fed funds rate as reasonable. He thinks the balance sheet could shrink to true trillion, but he also mentioned that QE is a distinct possibility in the next recession. So why are they already talking about QE again? Yeah, it was that was I wouldn't even call that interesting because that probably again came from a question of some sort. Somebody probably said, "Can you rule out QE forever?" And he said, "No." That's why a lot of these like one-liners from the Fed they're just they're not interesting because you I don't know what the context of it was. I, well, I, he also, the Fed, hit Bullard also views that the Fed, he doesn't believe they have to raise rates any higher. He says the job growth is consistent with 2% GDP growth. The equity valuations are on the high side of a historical experience, but does not see systematic risk in the economy. Mm -hmm. So he basically says everything is fine exactly where it is. Yep. And then somewhere in that speech, may not be listed here, I guarantee you he said, but we're data dependent. And that's what I mean by that. You know, the, the probability for a June hike has dropped. It was at 87 earlier in the week. It's at 78.5 now. So it's dropped 9.2 points. It was at 87.7. Over to Williams, he also reiterated this week that they'll, they'll be normalizing the balance sheet sometime in the future. Rosengren likely to need Q. He also mentioned likely to need QE again in case of a downturn. He said the Fed's likely to hit zero rates again in the future, zero percent rates again. And Rosengren also said he's worried about the U.S. growing a bit too fast, which I, I don't know about that's. I mean, I don't see it yet in GDP, but we'll see. And if we get more stimulus, that could cause them to hike faster. Evans yeah, data dependent. Yep. Uh, Dudley came out, there's no great urgency for the Fed to tighten aggressively, and later this year, or at 18, Fed likely to start the balance sheet shrinking, so they've been really stressing the balance sheet shrinking again. Evans came out this morning, 
maybe a good idea to smooth out runoff from balance sheet. U.S. wages has not been growing strongly. There's more geopolitical uncertainty now than there was 18 months ago to two years ago. The downside risks at the moment are still predominate. Evan says we must make sure we can confidently get inflation rate up to target and reflected in short term interest rates. That's what he was saying this Friday morning. Finally, U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross says 3% economic growth, certainly not achievable this year, direct quote. And he also reiterated that the dollar is not too strong. Other currencies are too weak. (laughs) (laughs) I have no comment on that last one. How isn't it always one? Well, he's he's essentially making a veiled comment toward their central banks, how they should stop their QE. Yep. Especially, well, now we can switch over to currency and international markets because the Bank of England kept key interest rate at 0.25 percent, vote seven to one. Bank of England raises their 2017 consumer price index forecast to 2.7 versus 2.4, then cuts to 2019 to 2.2. They also said the UK may need tighter policy than yield curve implies. Household spending and GDP slowed markedly. Yeah, I like that he did not add in, but it's likely to be transitory, like our Fed did. He just said, you know, it's it's very similar. The Fed shouldn't have their opinions and their statement too much because that's what gives the market all these gyrations, and then they have to go back and correct them. Mm-hmm. Carney said household spending slowed. It did. That's it. You know, we already know they're data dependent, so... You speculate only that he agrees that it's slowed. It's slowed enough for the Fed to notice that it's slowed. But the U.S. Fed, the FOMC, you know, went on record as saying, but this is probably not going to persist. So they were giving the market direction, which I just don't think they should do. Is there anything else that caught your – there wasn't much in the foreign international markets this week. Is there anything else caught your eye, any talk you heard about you know, EU and Brexit or anything? Draghi was very terse. <laughs> Draghi got, got questioned pretty hard by um, parliament members, and uh, he gave a speech to the Dutch. And the Dutch members of parliament actually beat him up pretty good for QE. And he was he was answering questions in a very terse manner. I remember one question. They said, "Would you?" Uh, it it had to do with bailing out some, or I'm sorry, restructuring a country in the EU's debt. And he's like, "I'm not going to answer a question that has no possibility of happening." And just kind of looked away. He got very offended by the line of questioning about his policies. He basically said, "Our policies have created 4.5 million jobs, and that's it. That's the fact, and that's that." And would not talk about. It. He was just very. Like, very offended. I thought that was funny. It was funny that the Dutch are asking this question. I'm feeling sort of lost that now that the French elections are over also. Yeah, yeah. Got the UK elections. We got the German elections, although now everybody believes that none of those are an issue now, which is possible. I mean, the UK elections are coming in June, and we've got Germany's elections. I'm not sure when they are. But we do have the OPEC meeting this weekend, which I left out of the oil update. It's more important than any election coming up. What, do you have a why this week? Today's edition of the What and the Why is brought to you by Motive Wave Software. Motive Wave Software is a well-established developer of easy-to-use, full-featured charting, analysis, and trading software built for the individual trader. Motive Wave offers the best charting tools used by the pros, such as Elliott Wave, Fibonacci, Gartley, GAN, and Ratio Analysis, but it's presented in a very easy to use way. Motive Wave has a product to fit any budget and any trading style, and one of the very best features, it's available on Windows and Mac. So go to pathtradingpartners.com right now to get your 14-day free trial, and then visit them at motivewave.com. No. No, why? I really don't. I mean... It, it was a pretty dead week overall. I mean, the most exciting, I shouldn't even say exciting, but like the thing that even the financial news channels covered the most was the FBI director's firing. That was what they covered the most. And that was what gave us that tiny little spike in VIX where I thought I was actually going to make money on that trade. It just, it was quiet. It was just very, very quiet. The only thing I would say is that the the 
Q2 numbers on the jobs front that have come in have been good. The jobs number was strong on Friday, and the two Q2 jobless claims numbers that we got, the three actually, the moving average is down to one point, uh, the continuing claims is down to like 1.918 million now. Uh, it was expected at 1.989 this week, cumulative. So it uh, looks like it's about to drop below 1.9 million on continuing claims. So the job market is grinding out improvement in Q2. So we'll see if that leads to other figures. I mean, again, the retail sales disappointed, but we'll see if that picks up next month. And, and we'll wage growth is still lags. lagging. Yeah, wage growth is lagging. I mean, it's increasing, but it's lagging. You know, a point two in that last number. That's not enough, but it is still on an upward trajectory. So we'll see. I expect the GDP model from the Atlanta Feds to change a lot of times. So, but Goldman Sachs had like a four handle on their GDP estimate recently for the second quarter. So people are optimistic, but I'm still going to hate this VIX where it is. I mean, to me, it's like you just don't you don't look at a VIX at 24 year lows in the current climate and say that it's not a buy. Just it is to me. And the VIX doesn't really have price patterns, so there's, you can't. Really, it's kind of hard to chart, you know. I've been charting it quite well, actually. Well, I'm just saying it's in a it's in a horizontal channel for 20 years, save for three oh, spikes. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not channel. like the VIX is going to trend higher. You know, I'd almost be interested, Mike, in seeing the charting more like a like a an hourly VIX, because you could have hourly VIX trends, right? Mm-hmm. But like the longer term VIX, it's just in a channel for 25 years. What's going on with the odd spike? There's a, there's a floor. And essentially, there is some ceiling. I mean, you're not going to have right. It's not going to go to a million. But yeah, there's a floor and a ceiling, horizontal channel, which is what I mean by there's no. You know, it's difficult to trade price patterns in the VIX on a longer term chart. But we are at the floor. We are. Yep. <laughs> right. Yep. So. Yep. That's it. That's my why. My why yep. is a very general why. I don't have a specific why. Why is that you can have a dead week and not have to be excited about it. You know, there's a feign excitement to a quiet market. Yep. You have a what? Yep. What's your what? Silver. Shoot. Watching for a, uh, I mean, silver's dropped. Wow. Back, where was that? On the 17th of April, we were trading up around 1860. Traded down to a low of 1606 this week. That's a pretty big drop. Watching we potential trend line trade against the R zone. But on a close above 1650, you could see a there's really two major targets, 1670 and 1680 are the two price targets. And this is not a whole long term buy. This is a, a trade potential trade in silver, but it needs to get above 1650 on a closing basis on the daily for it to trigger. I like it. But it's again, you could see. It's trading against the rotation zone, so it's not the highest probability long trade, which is why it's not an investment trade. It's a trade trade. That's my what. There you go. You left out of international news that the um, the, the United States is having a crackdown on Italy for expressive making phone cases. Uh, is it still suspended? It's still suspended. Mo case update. Are you going to email Kickstarter and find out what the hell is going on? Yes. Can we have an espresso making pillow? <laughs> I just want espresso making eye watch. <laughs> if Apple does that, they've really gotten the wearables right. <laughs> sending them a, a contact email. I'm sending Apple an email right now. For Bob's segment of the market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is basically me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have anything else this week. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Even though it was a slower week, we did cover a lot of ground. Yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Were you distracted by the espresso case again? 